now that uh, we are, yeah, we're live now. Um, welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, uh, a very special guest on a very sensitive topic that's intrigued the world for, man, maybe a decade and a half, right? It's director David Bellino, America's, the producer and director of America's Deadliest Rock Concert, The Guest List, which premiered on February 20th on The Reels Channel, which is available in Canada and, of course, in the, in, in the U.S. The Guest List is partially based on the book Killer Show, The Station, Nightclub Fire, America's Deadliest Rock Concert, written by John Barrylick. Thank you for joining us, John. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, David, sorry. sorry. David, that's okay. John's not here. He could have been. John's not here. <laughs> <laughs> but he, so, he does do some with me. Too. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was traveling throughout New England at that, actually that week, I think I was in Massachusetts. And when I heard about it the following day, my first reaction was that could have been me. You know, I got, you know, I had a tendency to go straight to the front of the stage and, and, you know, if I'm traveling, I like to see who, which bands are playing in the neighborhood. And that, that was my first reaction. It's like, wow, this, you know, this could have been any one of us. So uh, I think that comes home throughout throughout the documentary. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a very common uh, response that I get. Everybody puts themselves, he's talking to Eddie Trunk and everybody in, in the U.S. on this. And everybody was like, you know what, these are the clubs that I go to. And that's me. And that's me in the front row. And um yeah, it hits home for a lot of people uh, that way. So it's February, certainly from, sorry. Yeah. It was February 23rd, 2003. I'm just looking at the timing and I'm just, why is this being released now? You know, there was a big wide news cycle, of course, like anything else at the time. And um, we went all over the place, as you can imagine. But the news cycles are, are pretty narrow, uh, even with a, you know, a tragedy this big. It was a very small town and a very small state. And it was the genre of music that, as you know, you know, can be, I don't want to say controversial, but it's got its, you know, niches and people like us who love to go to these shows sometimes like, so I'm not sure how much we're looked at, uh, you know, Dee Snyder in, in the film obviously says, Hey, you know, if this was you too, it might've been a different story. Um, so I think it, it didn't take long for it to sort of dissipate. You know, there was a seven year uh, aftermath in terms of legal, uh, criminal, civil, but um, there's an aftermath that never ends when it comes to people and, and the human tragedy and what today, you know, the people that you see in the film that you met when you watched it, um, they live with this every day. You know, they wake up with this every day. So, you know, I moved back to Rhode Island uh, just to raise my girls, they were one and three years old at the time. In 2002, I was in Los Angeles prior in the music video industry and film industry. And I woke up that morning and I think a lot of people in our world remember where they were, you know, when they saw the news that morning. And um, I said to myself, you know, I don't know how it's going to come together. I, I work with these bands uh, and I'm from Rhode Island, but I know someday I need to tell the story. I just, I feel like I'm the one for some reason that is, is going to tell the story. You know, for some reason, years and years went by. Um, I could see maybe the first seven or eight years because it was so, it was in the courts and there was a lot of legal muck going on. But then it just, I think it just sort of faded away in people's memories. There's always been this online, you know, controversy of who did it and all these things that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit. But it's a really good question. I don't know why no one's tackled it and, and didn't. And um, I think the answer to your question in terms of timing is just that for me, when I went back in my mind saying, you know what, it's the right time. It just happened to be the right time for me. Um, I was in between projects and I'm like, you know what, if I don't do this now, it's not going to happen. I didn't realize it was going to take, you know, six, seven years. <laughs> um <laughs> The, the the journey of making this film is a is a story unto itself it was very complicated to get to this point. So I guess when you add all that up, you know, the legal aftermath, and just sort of that dead time with society and culture and not caring about you know, '80s rock anymore in that little period, and then all of a sudden my time that I had to be able to bring this to life again, it's been almost 20 years. I know it sounds crazy, and I do get that question a lot, but that's the best you know explanation I have for it. I think yeah. for people 
who didn't grow up during this time, what is, and, and let's just start off basic here. What is the premise of this movie? Just for the people who have never, don't know about it, right? Because there are people out there who don't know about it, who didn't grow up in that era, who didn't hear the news reports. There was no Twitter and there was no YouTube back then. Right? There wasn't. There wasn't. Give us the premise of this movie. Yeah, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that too, is because one year after is when Twitter and, and you know cameras on cell phones, and you gotta remember this happened just before that. So it was a, on a cold winter night in New England, which is typical in February, um, 460 people jammed into a small rundown roadhouse as you typically would have it in a town called West Warwick, Rhode Island, a very small town, a very small state uh, to see Great White, you know, one of their favorite, you know, many bands on the list of nostalgia and the hit songs that we all love from the 80s. And they got on stage. Uh, they, for whatever reason, which is again, something that we could discuss, but they lit off a, a pyrotechnics display at the beginning of their show, very first show. It caught the sides of flammable foam, acoustic foam, and the place went up in flames. And of course, people didn't realize it at the time. They thought there was it was part of the show. If you didn't make it out in 90 seconds, you weren't making it out. And um, it's a very, it, it happened very fast, but it's essentially the story of the people who suffered greatly over the years, you know, from that night and how fate and how all these chain of events occurred and to really understand, you know, how we can never, how something like this should never happen again, how we can help prevent it from ever happening again. And just giving attention to the people who went through this and still go through it uh, today. So I think in general, you could look at it as, as a tragedy in rock. It's, it is America's deadliest rock concert. It still is, and it probably always will be. And, uh, you know, I've met people, I've gone to concerts in, Ro in Rhode Island, and uh, it was a Y&T concert. I met people from there, and I remember them saying, you know, I was supposed to go that night. I got tired, yeah. you know, weekday, I got tired after work, and I decided not to go. And you can see in your film the serendipity of events, you know, like the lady that just missed her turn off and said to herself, this is not meant to be. You know, it's it just, that's what I took away from the film. It's just, you know, life, that's life, right? I mean, certain events lead you in certain directions. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because fate, serendipity, these things, and you can hear one of our characters, Paula McLaughlin, say, you know, after this happened, I don't believe in coincidence anymore. It just, it can't be. And the story of her brother and his young, beautiful wife <sighs> you know, happened, happened to be, I mean, the, the tattoo that she was, getting him for his birthday. His birthday was on the 13th of February. And this young, beautiful couple, they were married one year and they were so excited to get this tattoo. And Scott Green, who's the tattoo artist, you know, was booked. He just happened to be booked. And let's just push it to next week on the 20th. And it's exactly what you're saying. So this couple and then goes- And Jack on. Russell happens to be there that day that he gets- <laughs> Jack just felt he needed a tattoo that night of the show. I mean, literally just a few hours before they happen to be all there together that night and oh my god jack russell's in the tattoo shop so you know these kind of things you you can't make up you know you can't write this stuff and uh and again the the tattoo owner's wife sandy arenas who you see in the film dressed in red she was she should have been there too you know she would have been one of the people we're talking about but like you said she just took a wrong turn and just said ah you know what and Scott called her from the lobby that night and said, ah, I think I'll just stay home. That, that's like the 9-11, right? The stories of 9-11 where, you know what? I feel I don't feel well today. I'm not going to go to work. And that's where the tragedy happened, right? It's just you're, when your time yeah, and you comes, wonder. your time comes. You know, that that's what it comes down to, right? Right. And, and the two, you know, and I'm sure you can relate to this, but the story of Jimmy and Mike, the two young college kids who were so excited to get an interview with Jack. To similar Alan. to what you that's, do and hey, what we do on know, a weekly basis exactly <laughs> well you know at 19 years old you know think about yeah. what a big deal it is you know they talk to dan beaker the tour manager and um oh wow we're gonna head down and we're gonna talk to jack on the tour bus they're so excited and 
you know, you see what happens a few hours later, you know, one of them gets out and one of them doesn't, which is another really hard thing to believe how you could be at the front of the stage together and one gets out and one does it. And, and John Berelick at the end of the film says it very well is it's all chance it, where you were standing and which direction you just happened to, to decide to go one step the wrong way is death. One step the right way is, is a window. And, you know, Ty Langley, Langley as well, right? The rest yeah. of the band went this way and he went that way. And unfortunately he perished. Ty Longley, correct. And, and um, from, from what I understand, um, it, he was going back to get his guitar as a possibility from some of the things I read. But uh, yeah, yeah, just just uh, decisions, you know, quick choices. And, and um, I don't think you can base these choices on anything. I'm sure that you've, you know, you've listened to the story of Joe Kinnan, um, the burn survivor, and it's a heartbreaking, but it's a very inspirational story it and is. what he decided to do with his life. Uh, same thing, you know, someone stepped on his shoe and um, that was it. You know, you know I, I, hats off to you because I think, and I, I've, we, me and Alan watch a lot of music documentaries and we go through a lot. This is very well done. And you. because you're approaching it from every angle and, you know, you put it in an hour and a half, it's not easy to do, right? You're always wondering as an editor, am I going to put this scene or am I going to put that scene? And not only that, but it's done tastefully because a lot of production companies and directors would make this more sensational, right? You didn't, you didn't go for the sensational angle. You went for the historic, uh, you know, angle from every... And everybody was fair game when it came to the blame game, right? It was all presented the way it should have been present presented. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. And um, you know, I think I think the human brain can fill in the things that we don't need to see, yes. right? Yes. I mean, yes. you know, and when I approached this film, you know, I wound up just trying to put myself into every one of those shoes as a persona, right? So. Yes. What is it like to be Mike who escaped? What is it like to be Jimmy who didn't? What is it like to be Joe? And then taking that one step further, Paula and Jay, you know, this couple that I've become very close to and just understanding what they've gone through. The injo- Whether or not it's injustice is, is, is a topic for another day. And it, but they what they felt as injustice, again, it's a subjective thing. And you can see Jay, who's not only a firefighter for 30 years, but Imagine being a first responder and going to the site and having two family members that you're trying to find there at the same time. I mean, you know, these things, you, you don't get rid of that. So I thought it was very important to focus on that. And, and, you know, he said some things that are tough to hear and he's very authentic and very real, but you know what, you know, that's what documentaries are all about. Um, it is funny because it's on the, the border of being a music doc and not so much, right? Really more of a human story, but right. I tried to blend it so that music fans could stay engaged without being great white behind the music, you know? Um, but also enough so that people who had no idea of 80s rock, great white, what have you, would also be engaged because of the themes, you know, the, yes. like you're saying, the human themes that, that run through this. Yeah. So, I mean, Again, the, what I, I loved about the movie, and Jimmy alluded to it as well, is that you let people make up their own minds, kind of presenting the facts. You come to your own conclusion. Grief, they all went through the grief process. You know, it's sad. How can we prevent this happening again? Then it's the blame game. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, we can get into a few uh, few specific examples here. I mean, you know, Dee Snyder, like, and you mentioned it earlier as well, it's like, okay, would the judicial system care more if it wasn't a heavy metal concert with working class people? So again, you leave people come to their own conclusions, but I'd like to know your feeling on that. Yeah, um, so you hit a good point because that was very intentional throughout is to make sure that whether it's Jack Russell, who people have very strong feelings about, whether it's 80s music, whether it's the justice system, whether it's you know the blame, is it the club owners, the fire marshal, you know, all these things. I think the important thing to do was to let you as a viewer decide. Now, I can only do so much in 88 minutes. If you read the book, Killer Show, yeah. and I think they, they make a really good package together, right? Because if you see the doc, we can only touch on things. If you decide as a viewer 
you want to go deeper into the research. I know many people have hit Google. You know, I, I, want, I want to read the book now, just so you know, yes. I want the details. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right, exactly. Yeah. But um, going back to your question, I think specifically on the genre of music, you know, Eddie Trunk puts it really well too, is I think at that time, yeah, I think there was a bias and a prejudice. I think since then, you know, with the festivals now and sort of the resurgence of a lot of the bands, and it's pretty cool. Um, but you know, you you know that up and down curve, right? You know, the eighties and the, then I touched on what happened with the nineties, what happened into the two thousands. Very but again, well done. Very if I, well done. If I, you know, if I had a limited series, which I was initially planning on, which we still might get to, is I would have spent an entire episode taking people down. And the reason why I think it's important to go down that music hole for an episode is because you know you'll begin to feel why it was so important for these people to be in that club people say why, why are you in this shit club you know this little and and it's because of something that's very hard to describe it's what these what this music and what these songs mean to people there was something about that genre and something about that culture that we all love so um you know just trying to address your original question yeah i think there was a, a bias at that time which d explains really well maybe well, not so much now but certainly you know back then. And, and i should also mention this it's important you know the guys who did participate in this movie and uh, there is d snyder there's michael sweet who's a friend of ours there's don Dawkins. there's lita ford um that's just to name a few of them and they all put yeah. in some really good and eddie trunk like you mentioned yeah and of course jack russell is there they all put in their points of view, which were so valid throughout the, you know, what they had to say, especially D. He really made some, and it's probably to Alan's point, you know, it could have been anyone. It could have been any band. It could have been. Because me and Alan, and I'm sure yourself too, we've been in those gigs, right? We were there yep. and it could yep. have been us. Yes, right? yeah, absolutely. and. You know, I think it was very important. The, the intent of bringing the music, you know, voices in there was because of a longer version. Because we, like I said, the intent originally was that we're going to take you behind the scenes of festivals today. We're going to take you back to the 80s. We're going to dive in. And, and so the relevance of D and Doc and Doc, Don Dockin and Michael Sweet were the intention was to expand that. But because we were so cut on time i mean the film is really about like you said the premise of what happened we couldn't get too deep into that because again and we'd push people away who weren't music fans so many of our viewers are people that are i don't want to say true crime but they want human stories and they may not be metal fans so mm -hmm. the more we got into that but, but then again on the opposite side we didn't want to push those fans away because that was the whole point no, no, of the you film got, you, you know? you're well balanced very well balanced yeah. very very thank well you balanced. Know, there was the tragedy in Cincinnati in 79 at the Who concert. And, and like you said, this is this is unfortunately one of the deadliest concerts, 100 people that passed away, plus another 200 that were injured. And and they made changes following that, you know, uh, festival seating in Cincinnati. My question to you, do you think that changes have been made due to this tragedy? Well, they, they absolutely were, but you wonder how much is politics, you know, of course, I mean, what, what are they going to do right after this happens? You know, I mean, people's head would be on a platter if they didn't start changing things. So grandfathered in buildings that didn't have to have sprinklers like the station um, inspection codes and things like that. Um, however, from what I understand from some people in the film and, and some of the, the uh, parents who, who spent a lot, a long time who lost their children after, trying to change some of these laws. It appears to me that a lot of it, some of it has fallen back into, and that's what happens, right? It's just like anything yeah, else is it, that's right. is you get lackadaisical again. And going back to your original question, which kind of ties around in terms of why now, it is kind of interesting that when things get really lackadaisical, that's when things happen again, right? So yes. um, it, I think it's good for that reason is it, at least it starts a dialogue and again, and, um, I mean, the, the reason why these people wanted to be in this film and do it now, it, it too soon is too soon. Like, you know, they're just, they just don't want to talk and they're not going to, but enough time has passed that they feel that, you know, I, w I don't want my loved ones to ever be forgotten, you know? And so Mike and Sandy and Jimmy Gahan and Scott Green and the, the people that you meet in this film, 
the motivation of why they came to me to be in the movie as well was just so that I don't think you ever would have known who Mike and Sandy Hugasian were, except now you do, right? And that's the point is let's not forget them and hopefully learn some lessons along the way. David, I, mean, uh, I, I, I want to throw, go ahead, yeah. Alan, sorry. No, go ahead, Joe. David, I wanted to like put out the characters and the blame game and just talk about it very high level. People could watch the movie for the more details. Sure. Yeah. And, so, and, and I want Alan's opinion on this too. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll spell out the characters and you tell me the, the, I'm trying to rephrase this properly, what their commitment is. We have the fire inspector who, pa who everybody knows, like every city has their own fire inspector uh, or the chief or whatever he is. There's a certain code that every sort of nightclub restaurant or any sort of a private business or public has to adhere to, right? Then you have the band and everybody to understand this was not great white as we know it. This was a solo band just billed as great white, which was Jack Russell that night. Then you have the tour manager who runs the corporation, we'll call it, of the band. Then we have the pyro guys. And we found out they weren't licensed, but we have the pyro guys. And then we have the club owners and their, um, how do I say this? And their sort of maybe, I call it greed perhaps, that they wanted to further increase the capacity of the club by sacrificing some of the safety protocols. Now, when you have all these characters after you analyzing tons, of, and sorry, I'm long-winded here, okay? But after analyzing all this information, what have you concluded where the blame actually really lies? Well, I think that's the thing is it's it's not just one thing, no. you know? It, it wouldn't have happened with just one of those pieces pulled out. That's the problem is it's very scary when you look at all the things that had to happen, all the things that had to go wrong, all the mistakes that were made or all the ego or the greed or whatever motivations behind those mistakes. But I'll touch on them again very, very quickly. You have a venue. Um, a lot of times they're in the business of making money. Uh, no, Nobody intentionally plans to hurt anybody. And I think that was clear that you know these are people that pay to come in the club were corners cut was it mismanaged I, I mean those are we leave that for debate so you have the club owners michael and jeffrey dedarian at the end of the day they were two of the three that were indicted criminally only and uh didn't serve a lot of time but again we explain that in the movie is it has to do with intent the yeah. the, the the sentencing has to do with criminal intent you know and so Dan Beakley, who was the tour manager of the band, he physically lit the pyro. I mean, now if you're thinking, okay, and you hear Jay McLaughlin say this, how can somebody not have fire extinguishers? How could somebody light off pyro and not have fire extinguishers? Um, didn't you see the foam? You know, so is Dan Beakley a bad guy? I don't think so. And I think many people in Rhode Island felt, you know, he was very remorseful. And many people in Rhode Island also felt that you know, he took blame where potentially, you know, maybe he shouldn't have in, in some cases. But but those are the three. So we're going to talk about five. The three are Michael and Jeffrey Dedarian and Dan Beakley. Those were the three who were indicted criminally, who served some amount of time. Club owner one, club owner two brothers, and the tour manager of Great White, which physically lit the pyro. The controversial two, the other, you know, two out of the five, is Jack Russell and the fire marshal. And they were not indicted. And the belief is that there is an immunity statute in Rhode Island, which essentially creates an immunity for the fire marshal unless it was malice. Um, again, I don't think there was any intent. That, again, is a controversial subject of why the fire marshal was not indicted. Likely it was because of, 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 of that as, as a possibility. Jack Russell you know, again, did he physically light the pyro? Nobody was in charge. So as John states in his book, you know, what about the person in charge? You know, we're blaming the person who actually lit, but you work for someone 
in charge. So that was the controversy around Jack. Why he was not indicted again criminally, nobody knows. Uh, everyone from a civil perspective when it comes to the lawsuits and so forth, that was clearly discussed in the film as well. So, so those are the five that I think if you take anyone out of there, think about it, right? The fire inspector says, no, nope. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not going to put this film on the wall. Wouldn't have happened. The brothers didn't, if, you know, there wasn't overcrowding, for instance, if there was overcrowding, um, you know, the choice of using the foam on the walls wouldn't have happened. Jack, if Jack, you know, the, if Great White was not doing pyro shows, um, it wouldn't have happened. If Dan Beakley was looking for extinguishers or did not hook up that night because he looked around and goes, ooh, you know what, this probably isn't a venue that we should light this up, it wouldn't have happened. So, you know, I think it, I think the blame goes around. And um, now how you penalize or how you, you know, whether it's criminal sentencing or civil, you know, again, it wasn't my job to, to lay out what I think or believe yeah, it was no, my no, job to try to, absolutely. to, you know, to, to give the viewer a sense of, you know, and again, there's more to it. So if you want to dig further, whether it's the book or some other source, we hopefully we gave you enough information that you could go dig more. So emotions are still running high that's clearly displayed in the film what's the community today how how does the community feel overall today you know uh, it'll never go away and as, as you see some of the the journalists and the news reporters who were there that night were affected greatly just having to cover that story and um and he states very well bob farrell one of the cameramen who was on scene you know it's a very very sensitive subject in rhode island probably has to do with being a small town a small community very yeah. close-knit everybody knows each other you know it's that sort of thing um i don't know if you picked up on it in the film but the the four seasons new england is is set in this area of the united states that the seasons you know summer to fall to winter to spring is a big thing you know it's a lot of reason why people come here and they they love it and it, it attaches to them and so there's a visual theme that runs through the film of those seasons as they change. And the reason why we did that is because that's what I've witnessed and experienced that affect these people the most. When, when the fall begins to change the snow and the winter, it triggers them. Like this is, we're coming on February again. And, and, and honestly, the community, like, I don't want to say shuts down, but you know, February is a very dark, month here you know yeah regardless and of what's the interesting you're not <laughs> right and 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 then when spring comes it's like this glimmer of hope right like we're we're getting out of this winter and the you know the the buds and the flowers begin to form and it's kind of like wow you know i don't need to think about this maybe for another year you know and that not quite that black and white but <clears throat> that's why and that's to me what the community represents you know being in new england and so yeah. we, we talked about Jack Russell. I remember at the time people defending him. Uh, I think he's a, you know, he became a broken man because of this. But, you know, a lot of people see him as either the devil or also a victim because, you know, like the intent was never, obviously never there. Uh, you know, how were you able to approach Jack and get him to be so candid on, on, on your documentary? Yeah, that, that was a critical piece. And when I talk to people, they ask me, you know, how did this all come together? And I told them it pretty much fell apart, you know, a half a dozen times, six times, seven times, and it came back together. Um, one of the critical pieces, it, it took a lot of components that all had to fall into place. John as a lawyer agreeing with his book and understanding that I'm coming from the music angle, making sure I need Jack Russell's story. John Barrico is like, you know, what are you talking about? It, you know, the, in the families as well, just just to understand that. So it, it was very difficult to pull the pieces that I wanted together to make the film happen. One of those pieces was Jack Russell. It was probably one of the most critical pieces and it was a difficult thing to make some people understand and some didn't. Some did not want to participate because Jack's story was going to be in the film. Um, the film's called The Guest List and the concept and some of the premise revolves around this idea like you were mentioning earlier about you know, just the idea of being on a guest list, whether it's through a tattoo parlor or a meeting at a hotel lobby, um, how could you not have the person who created the guest list in a film called The Guest List? So it was way more than just putting a microphone in someone's face for, you know, an hour. Um, it, it was embedding 
with Jack and his life for a few years. I mean, the only way to get what you saw on camera was to create a trust and really have him understand that I don't think he, there'll be another opportunity. If he was on your show and you asked him about the fire, you see how he reacts. You've seen interviews before. How can you, how can you, you can't just answer somebody. There is no simple answer. Yeah. So the only way to do it is documentary style where you feel like you're living with Jack through his ups and downs and his addictions and his happiness and his wife. It's the only way we could do it. And that's goes back to one of the original questions you had is that it took a very long time to, you know, to, produce this film because of that reason and not just jack but the families too trust access feeling comfortable to tell the story and that that i think comes through that's what i'm probably most proud of is just the realness and the authenticity that everybody has these are not news interviews these are you know this is the real deal and including jack you know as a viewer now, as I watched it, I think the outcome, and I, I know this might bother people, but I think the outcome worked out the way it should have worked out, where the owners, you know, had the conviction. Maybe the, the conviction or the sentence should have been more. I don't know. That's not for me to decide. But at the end of the day, it is the club that it doesn't matter what Jack Russell wants to do, pyro or not, it is up to them to if it was in the contract then there was no pyro allowed or it had to be by a licensed pyro person right then it is the club at the end of the day who who has to deal with that consequence at least that's how i see it you know um it's a it's a fair point i mean you know i agree with you to some extent um because yes that that's your boundary between safety and, and, and let me just is, let me just add this and you yeah. could answer it i have a a, a fishing a, a boat license right and without that boat license i can't drive a boat in, in 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 montreal like if i was to go to a a boat club and say oh i'd like to rent a boat and they didn't look at my credentials or they kind of sidestepped it then it would be on them not me because they are the gatekeepers of that of the safety right and if they didn't have fire extinguishers on the boat again it's on them you know if the boat wasn't built as it should be with the right safety precautions then it's on them now th that's how i looked at it and sorry to cut you off go ahead no i mean you're right and this is why this story i think in general has always been so intriguing because everyone has their points of view and they're very strong and they see different things and um and, and and i agree i mean if, if that's your business and this is the business you run um this is the way you should run your you know from from the safety aspect but i guess john points out something that always resonates with me in, in the film in the, in his book is that there was only one individual that was actually paid and it was his job to make sure that the people in that building are safe so the club owners, I agree with what you're saying, and you would think that the responsibility, but you're putting a lot of trust in, in people that yeah, promote. The fire marshal, I would agree and, to. The fire marshal, yes, yes. Yeah. You know, so, and again, it's not pointing or any one individual, but John does bring up a really good point. And again, whether I agree or not, it's not the point, but out of all these people we're talking about, the, the, this is someone's job, like you're saying, Yes. who it is that needs to, look at the credentials make sure i get paid to do that. i get paid to keep you safe right I get paid. in the book does it ever mention that there was a fire marshal report of any sort saying that this is not up to code so that's uh quite quite covered a lot in the book because of the past inspections he uh it was inspected for three years prior that and the foam apparently was on the walls for three years so the biggest question that people have is why was that never cited if the flammable foam was on the wall for three years and um you know so then, yeah, I, amend, the then book, I amend my statement and include the fire <laughs> marshal as well it's like well, again it, you know it, it's a, again i don't know i, I didn't know i don't have that information right so yeah. Yeah. again yeah. we can play the blame game all day yes. long right it is what it is but you know you, you go back to the serendipity of the thing they wanted to make sure they bought the the the, the well what they changed to the station they bought this club 
went around to see the neighbors and by pure comedy of errors, like you said, the guy in the backyard who was close to the club says, hey, I can get, I'm a salesman for this phone that will deaden the sound. Like what are the chances that the one guy you're gonna go see to make sure that you're gonna please the neighborhood when it comes to sound in bars and clubs and bands happens right. to be a salesman for this phone that they decided to use. Right, and, and then you ask yourself, okay, well, you know, is this the right phone? Did anyone care? It's cheap phone. I mean, I don't think everyone, anyone ever thought that, oh, okay, this is flammable. We're going to put it up anyway. I, you know, it, it, it's very difficult. And that's why I think the film, that, that was my intent is, you know, just like you're saying, let, watch the scenes, read the book, and then you can make up your own mind and people can argue all day long. But again, I think that's the point of a doc like this. It's it, opening up the dialogue is just, it's really important. Uh, it's not to point blame. What's done is done, but at the same time, you know, maybe maybe this never happens again, right? I think that's what's the most important. I mean, that week after, I remember Lizzie, they interviewed Lizzie Borden, like you did with Don Docking to get past perspective and leader for, and he, he named five or six clubs that are tinder boxes throughout the United States that they all play at. He was able to right. rattle them off at the end of his fingertips. So they knew which ones. And again, Jimmy and I go around, we're, like you said, those two fellows for the power hour that kind of remind us of me and Jimmy. Uh, we That's go around, right. we go to different venues. And I know there's one right here in, in the city here that if anything happened upstairs, we would never get out of the basement where we do a lot of our interviews. So I was hoping things would change. Like you said, there was all kinds of talking at the time, but I, I look at it 20 years later and I'm not seeing too many changes, unfortunately. I, I agree with you. And, you know, when D says it could have been any of us, of course, he's referring to bands like we as bands, you know, we think it's fun and we can light stuff off or have fun and, you know, and when D says that, you can see it, it's uh, that look on his face is you're right. It could have been any of us. I think that also goes for the club, right? It could have been like you're saying any of us and, and the club owner could have gotten on to the dock and said the same thing. And, and so it's like Russian roulette, right? It, it will happen. And, and it just, in this case, because of all these things happened here, and this is the story that everyone talks about, but sure, there could be another one and it likely will be and some maybe not as, you know, fatal or what have you, but um, maybe it, this it is hard to believe. might save lives. And I think that's important. You know, it's important I, that everybody knows about it, it for the promoters, yeah. for the bands, for the tour managers, yeah. for the club owners, for the, uh, the, the, the inspectors. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a very important movie that I'm happy that you really made it. Has it affected you psychologically watching hours and hours of people? Yeah. In, in, um, in sort of in, in need of help. Yeah, I it 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 wasn't. It's not so much being in the editing. Well, I shouldn't say that. The answer is yes, of course. I mean, it changed my life. The the storytelling process and the journey that I took as a filmmaker, just explaining, you know, the trust that had to be built and how much time it took. I mean, I had to, you know, but I'm not sure it was so much watching in the in the editorial post. It was the process of getting to know people. I remember sitting down at dinner. We met with Joe. Kenan and his wife, Carrie, you know, for the first time. And it was shocking, you know, and after a while, it just sort of like today, Joe and I are, you know, we just, I don't even, I don't even see his physical, you know, difference. And, and because, so I think it's just a matter of time, but initially all this stuff. Oof, yeah. I mean, so I, I don't think it affected me in a bad way. I think it affected me in a great way. I think in a sense where, you know, I, I truly do feel that the doc, everybody you see in the doc and the crew became a family in a sense. And that happens a lot on films, but especially this one, cause it's so intimate and it took so much time to develop. I mean, I, you know, the tightrope yeah. that I, you know, that we walked between the Jack side and the other side, but I felt I, I had to stick to my ground. I guess an important thing I, I do want to, mentioned too is that I think if the Jack Russell thread and the guest list thread and the music thread and that whole thing, the controversy of the band and everything, that was removed from the film. And it became a story about a small town who had a tragedy and the small group of people who it's painful and it would be good, but it's not going to be what it is now. It's not going to be the guest list. And That's it. what I had to convince some of the people who were very concerned about the whole Jack Russell thread being in the film is I put it in very simple terms. 
you want your story of your loved ones and your story to get out to more than 10,000 people in Rhode Island, if you wanted to get out to a, a million national audience, this is what we have to do. And I know it almost seems like, you know, I know they didn't want to do that, but now I think they understand why is because the attention that it's getting. So, you know, Mike and Jimmy now, you know, Sandy and you know, Scott and you know, Mike and Sandy, you wouldn't if it wasn't at this level and that in the choice of creating that not controversy intentionally, but making sure that they understood that Jack Russell's story thread is a critical part of the film, not to give him a platform to apologize, not for any other reason other than it makes a well-rounded film yeah. that uh, makes you think. On the Jackal Russell point, I'll, I'll, you know, I want to tell all the victims that sometimes the wor the best, the best sentence is to be living and living with the, the knowing that you've killed a hundred people sometimes i mean you'd be better off dead not living that way i mean living with that torture day in and day out is 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 not you know that is a sentence you know um you, you know every day of your life you know and, and i'm not minimizing it in any way you know i'm sure some days jack is like wish he wasn't around to go through that right well that's, it's, that's a really good point and and um that was probably one of the things in my mind. I remember when I was talking about what, what is it like to be Mike and Jimmy in the club? What is it like to be Joe in the club? What is it like to be Jack Russell? And so one of the first things that came to my mind in coming up with the concept and the premise around this is, is that, how do you live with that? You know, and you see in the film, you'll see Scotty Dunbar, who is a survivor who feels very differently about Jack and, and he forgives and he is up on stage and he embraces him and he's, got past a certain level and then you'll see Vicky uh, Egan who um, you know has very strong words about Jack but again for good reasons and it's their individual choice of you know but I think it was important to show those views just to give people a, an example or you know the, a symbol of what a lot of the world feels and it to be him I think is, is difficult and I think I I did want to show that um, as a filmmaker, not just as a platform, you know, for him. Very and just well. to add to that, I mean, there's there's forgiveness for those that are culpable. There's your self forgiveness. I think Vicky mentions about survivor guilt in the film yeah. as well. So you spoke about the community. Is there a sense of forgiveness? Is do you think over? Uh, it, it might take more time, but do you think there could be a sense of forgiveness for everybody all around? No, um, it's a very individual thing. And one thing I have learned is, that, you know, that point specifically is that the people who have that, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it anger or what, I mean, they have the right to feel that way. I mean, I, you know, it's like, and the people who forgive, and I, I don't know if forgive is the right word too, because when I talked to Joe Kinnon, you know, I, you know, and again, I could only get into these vignettes so much in the 88 minutes, but Joe goes on to say a lot more things about this is not forgiveness, you know, this is acceptance. Yeah. He accepted the way he looked, he accepted his new life, he had a baby, he chose to, you know, and even Joe, you know, without putting words in his mouth. Um, so I think the term forgiveness is very strong. I'm not sure that exists at all, to be honest with you. I think acceptance and getting over the anger, you know, getting over that, that hatred inside, and some of the people in the film you'll see have it, you know. And I think that was also a balance that I had to strike is that some people feel, you know, teetering on that word forgiveness or acceptance and other people, I don't think will ever. And I think when you mentioned time, will time heal everything? I think for many, uh, it won't. You've done a great job in, uh, you know, preserving the memory of the people who passed away. Uh, you know, it touched me, the movie. And, uh, you know, and I think when it touches people, then people, and it'll, it's, it's a piece of history now. And, you know, people can talk about it and hopefully you save lives, you know, by doing this, like I said before. And, uh, you know, you preserve the legacy of the people who were there and you 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 showed the feelings of the survivors or the people who were affected by the deaths. And uh, you covered it very well, very well balanced. Congratulations. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on too to discuss it. it they, they are really important topics and I think they're also very interesting to listeners to just debate you know because some of the things that we said today they 
may or yeah. may not agree and, and that's Absolutely. good. They should have the right to have that dialogue. Yeah. And I was flipping back and forth throughout the whole movie. Who to blame, you know? And, and but that's that's the point, right? That's to figure it, is, it out. It to, it, so it doesn't happen again. All right. There you have yep. it. Uh, David Bellino, director, producer of America's Deadliest Raw Concert, The Guest List. You can watch it on Reels channel. It's available in Canada as an app, a streaming service in the U.S. It's on the uh, on your cable or you could even get it as a stream, probably even online. So uh, thank you very much. And if there's anything else, you know, in the future that you are, um, you'll be doing any work or continuation of this, you're always welcome back on the show to talk to us about it. Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it very much. Um, it was a good talk. A, dif a difficult watch, but a must watch. It's something we should all watch and learn from. So yes. I thank you yeah. for David, for your neutrality through and through, presenting all sides. And uh, I think you did an excellent job and for a very important subject. I appreciate it. Thanks again for having me.